Hello, summer suns are glowing over land and sea and I hope you're finding some time to enjoy the good weather and maybe now we've eased up a bit on the lockdown there'll be an opportunity to have a chat with friends uh, in a strictly socially separated fashion. Our first hymn is Psalm 95. In some Christian circles it's known as the Venite, from the Latin for the first uh, two words, O come, O come let us worship God. We're going to hear it sung by the Scottish Philharmonic Choir uh, uh, with uh, a fantastic organist accompanying them and we're going to listen to it to um, a tune Bon Accord. Now, Bon Accord is a lovely tune that does a clever thing in the second half where the singers sing in a sort of round. Um, I'm sure some of the more musical people could tell me technically what uh, this music is called, this form of music. But what happens is you'll hear the tenor takes the line of the hymn and then each of the four parts take uh, the tune in turn. It's amazing to think that congregations used to sing like this routinely not so very long ago. So let's listen and worship God with Psalm 95. the words of the psalm in our ears. Let us come to God now in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we see your glory in the splendour of creation all around us. We marvel at its beauty and for the wisdom and the power of the one who brought all things into being. We rejoice in your strengthening of us, for the victories we win, for our presence together now before you in worship. We thank you for those everyday blessings which we take for granted, but are the tokens of the love of our Heavenly Father. 
Lord, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we have all manner of blessings still prepared for us and laid up in heaven, yet to be revealed. We have the sureness of your promise to be with us by the Holy Spirit. We have the Good Shepherd looking after us and caring for us, leading us to places of refreshment and security and comfort and guidance. The places where you have set us are pleasant places and we rejoice in those. But above all, we thank you that when all might have been lost, when we might have been doomed to eternal condemnation for our coldness of heart and disobedience of will, you redeemed us by Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us that too often we're absorbed with ourselves. Forgive us that we say foolish things and think foolish things and do foolish things. Come to us afresh by your Spirit. Cleanse us through the sacrifice of Jesus. Fill us afresh and enable us to worship and serve you for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible readings come from two places today. The first is from the book of Psalms, and it's Psalm number 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hand are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established for ever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provides redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him be eternal praise. And in the New Testament, we pick up the story of the day of Pentecost, when the uh, disciples were in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And we're at the end of Acts chapter 2, where Luke gives a summary of where they were after this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Amen. We thank God for his word. Now we're going to listen to another song which Sue brings to us. Thank 
Last time when we were looking at Acts chapter 2, I said there was an important principle we had to adopt in uh, looking at Acts, and that is to discern whether what Luke is setting before us is descriptive, that is, describing exactly what happened, or prescriptive, uh, setting before us a principle that the Holy Spirit is saying the church must adopt and it's not always easy to do that but equally if we don't do that sometimes we can find ourselves going on a wild goose chase as we try to imitate what we see happening in the book of Acts. So we've reached the end of the chapter and we've had this long account of all that happened and from verse 42 onwards, uh, Luke gives a summary of what is going on. And in verse 42, he says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. These four priorities, these, these four principles that the church set itself, this was its agenda. Let's just briefly look at these four things. First of all, we have the apostles teaching and it becomes clear very quickly that there was a central body of teaching of doctrine. The early church didn't operate by pooling lots of different opinions. They didn't sort of sit around and have meetings and say, well, well, come on, Jim, tell us what you think God's like. They believed what you called the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. This was the unique role that the apostles had to bring Christian truth 
into the world. And in fact, in many places in the New Testament, prescriptive parts of the New Testament, we, we find that doctrine is emphasised as being really important. Let's look at one or two examples quickly. In Romans chapter 6, at verse 17, Paul says, Though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. The allegiance is not to people, it is to the gospel itself. That's what God calls us to. Writing to Timothy in the first letter to Timothy, in the first chapter, verse 3, Paul says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Paul says to Timothy, the minister of Ephesus at that time, look, you have got to ter teach certain things as being the truth and you've got to expose other things as being false. It's not okay for everyone to believe what they personally believe because some people believe and pursue things that just aren't right. And in the second letter, Paul has this solemn warning, a, a, a warning made uh, to Timothy that we see coming true in the church now. For the time will come to Timothy chapter 4 verse 3, when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead, listen to this, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Now, this really inflames me this verse, because it seems to me exactly what we have, where in so many parts of the church, the, 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 the gospel, the doctrine of the apostles, the word of God have been abandoned, and instead people have gathered round themselves teachers who will say just what they want to hear. The second uh, thing they devoted themselves to was the fellowship. Now, they didn't always get this right, and we'll come to that very shortly. Um, but the emphasis was on the importance of sharing. Paul, uh, at the end of Romans, you know, in Paul's letters, he always has a bit at the end that's very practical. He says, be devoted to one another in love, honour one another above yourselves. There you are, this, this reiterating what Jesus said, that the great command is to love our neighbour. And within the church, that, that the fellowship of other people is where we should direct our love. And let's be honest, sometimes that is far from easy to do. Because in his providence, God puts together such a mixed multitude of people that sometimes it isn't easy to love other people. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't commit ourselves to the fellowship. Paul says further on in Romans chapter 14, Therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. There we are. That is the fellowship operating together in a way that is not going to hinder the spiritual growth and the spiritual well-being of others in the church. If you look at Corinth, the super spiritual church who are so proud of their spiritual gifts and who they were and what they were. Right at the beginning, Paul says, you're all at loggerheads with each other. There's no fellowship at all. You divide into lots of factions, those who like this and those who, who like that and those who follow this teacher, those who follow that teacher. 
That's wrong. It shouldn't be there. And in passing, I would say uh, we need to appreciate that these first two things in the church's agenda in the book of Acts, they go together. Uh, John, in his first letter, says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. There you have it. The apostles' teaching so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ so the fellowship and the doctrine go together you can't separate them you can't have one without the other the church led by the apostles devoted themselves to two more things and these are just a little bit unclear they are the breaking of bread and the prayers and there's a bit of disagreement between biblical scholars about it first of all the breaking of bread now either in that luke is referring to communion service the lord's supper that jesus had told his disciples to do in memory of him of his death of his um, giving of himself the perfect sacrifice for us so it's either the communion that's meant by the breaking of bread or it's fellowship meals where everyone from the church gathered together in one place and shared a meal together and some people have said it actually refers to both which it may do now i find i vacillate sometimes i think it means fellowship round a meal table and sometimes I think it means the Lord's Supper but actually I don't think it matters because either of these having a meal with a group of fellow Christians or coming to the Lord's table to share the Lord's Supper are a sort of glue that helps to bind the fellowship together that it actually affects our relationship with other people if we sit and eat and drink with them and the last thing the second of these two uh, vaguer things are are the prayers and some of the biblical scholars say well this means prayer meetings that they had specific meetings for prayer and others say, well, it means attendance at the times of prayer in the temple. Remember, they're living in Jerusalem where the temple is. At various times during the day, there would be a pause in the temple and a time for prayer. And as we look at the book of Acts, particularly at the beginning where the action is taking place in Jerusalem, we see that both of those were, were, were part of the church's life that they did attend the temple for worship and they did have an incredibly strong corporate prayer life and that it was the prayer that was the key to the spiritual effectiveness of the church. So here's the church's agenda. This is what following the apostles, the, these hundreds of people who are coming to faith in Christ commit themselves to. They commit themselves to the apostles' teaching. They commit themselves to having a lively fellowship. They commit themselves to sharing the experience of God's grace over a table. And they commit themselves to a life of prayer. Now, because all these four things are addressed specifically and instructively in various places in the New Testament, I would argue that what we have here is prescriptive in the church's understanding of what it means to be the church. If these four things are not the priority of the church, then we are only playing at being the church. But here we, we move on because there's a little bit more at this summary section at the end where we're told of some of the things 
that they did. And Paul sort of merges from these clear prescriptions to a, a more general description. We're told that they worshipped and shared meals together. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So really what this is, is a description of them putting into practice the fellowship and prayer side of their commitment. But this is not something that they were commanded by the Holy Spirit to do. And these things are not, are not things that we were commanded to do in this particular way. Hint number one, why it doesn't apply to us, there is no temple. And hint number one, A, we don't live in Jerusalem anyway. And hint number two, if you live like that, the money runs out very quickly. So I take this really as to being a, a, a summary of how they um, worked out their fellowship and their time of prayer together. Uh, that leads on to the second thing. We're told that they held all things in common. And I've hinted at the problem here. With that, the money runs out. And later on, we see this idea that the church would be one sort of commune with everyone sharing everything came unstuck. There were social differences. There were racial differences. There was the inequality of personal wealth of individuals. And so the church had to learn other aspects of the expression of generosity uh, on recognising the need to provide for brothers and sisters who are wanting, the need to take on board that it is actually a happier thing to do to give than to receive the need to give sacrificially. And these things are spoken of prescriptively, but nowhere is there a suggestion that the church is supposed to form itself into a little commune, which is separate from the world. So these couple of things that they did, Luke mentions, are really just to, to paint the background for us. And lastly, there are three things that happened. Now, all of these three things depended on the activity of the Holy Spirit and on the sovereignty of God in the matter. The first is expressed in verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. The word or there is in some translations fear and that gives you an idea that there was such a sense of the power and of the presence of God that even those who were not religious who are not investing emotionally into it were overcome by a sense of, of what a, a, a mighty thing was going on there and I, I believe that, that, that there is a hint there for us that the time to be impressed to be awestruck by the mighty work of God is not when we're in a, a closed group of people particularly a group of people who set themselves apart as being kind of special but when in the great crowds of people generally there, there is suddenly this overcoming by a sense of fear that God is doing something. Secondly, in verse 47, the, the first half of the verse, the first disciples were, were told, praising God 
and enjoying the favour of all the people. And all I can say is, great, as long as it lasted. And it didn't last long. Because actually, it is not reasonable to expect that if the church is faithfully fulfilling its mission, if it is faithfully declaring what God has declared in Jesus Christ, then the church won't be popular. And by the end of Acts, we're not seeing the apostles and the first Christians enjoying the popularity of all the people. We're seeing them being thrown into prison, being driven away, being rejected. The third thing is also in verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. This is the second time now that Luke has said this, that great numbers of people were coming to faith. I want to end here. And this should be such a huge pause for thought for us. Because let's face it, this has not happened for decades. Let's not talk up the game. For decades, the church has only known withering and dying. And even those new churches, those growing churches, have tended to thrive really on transfer of people from other churches for good or bad reason. So as we think about this, what do we need to think? We need to recognise we need the Holy Spirit to do the work we cannot do in the church. We need to be a church of prayer. And we need to be a church that has the Apostles' agenda. The Apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. Because really, if we go off doing these other things, we're not being the church of the New Testament. And there isn't any other church. Let's listen to another song now. Oh, 
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. As we think about the early church and we think about the church in our day, let's bring in prayer the church, the church in Scotland, the church of Scotland, the church here in Gala Shields to our Heavenly Father. Lord, you set your love on your people at the most tremendous of prices, at the price of your Son. And you named the church his church. We pray for the church that it may lay aside all the weights and hindrances and that as it reflects on what it is to be Christ's ones in this world, in this time of being shut up and shut in, we may, as your people, learn better how to be what you would have us be to the glory of your name. And we pray for the world we think that besides a pandemic the infection of the coronavirus COVID-19 there are swarms of locusts there are conflicts waging there is flood and famine and the suffering of different peoples has many different causes. Lord, you love the world you made, and we acknowledge that human beings have marred that world and have not been good stewards of the world. We pray for those who rule in the world, that they might be humbled and seeking to do what is pleasing in your sight, govern with justice and with equity. And we pray for ourselves. We are citizens of a country but we are also citizens of heaven. And that means how we deal with each other within the church, but even more importantly, outside the church, how we employ social media, how we manage our resources, how we set our priorities all need to be brought to our Father in heaven, Lord our God. We seek your guidance and direction. Help us to be the sort of people you would have us be and to do the sort of things that Jesus would do. Give us wisdom. Give us love. Make us faithful that not only by our words but by our deeds we, we may commend Christ. And we bring individuals whose needs we know, the people who are sick and the people who are caring for them, the people who fear that they will have no job to go back to, the people who frightened as 
to whether it will ever be safe to go out. The people who are weighed heavy by caring. And those thousand and one little worries, or maybe big worries, that we nurture in our hearts. We cast these burdens now on the God who cares for us. Lord, hear our prayers. And hear us as together we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. Today is Pentecost, or Whit Sunday, as people in some parts of the church call it. We've not made a big thing of it today because the Holy Spirit is always in the church. One of the most helpful things I was taught when I first became a Christian is that the Holy Spirit is the modest person in the Trinity. Now, I, I think, having studied theology, having been a minister for a long time, that is a very superficial expression, but I don't think it's an untrue expression. Because Jesus himself taught us, and the New Testament confirms, and the Old Testament hints again and again, that the Holy Spirit doesn't come to be the centre of attention. He comes to make Jesus the centre of attention. And that means he has to do things in us and he has to do things with us. But he doesn't do them to show off himself. And when people suddenly start claiming things for the Holy Spirit that detract from God the Father and from God the Son, they're putting a question mark over what they're saying or doing. Another Puritan prayer. It's called the Spirit of Jesus. And I leave this with you. Lord Jesus Christ, fill me with thy Spirit, that I may be occupied with his presence. I am blind. Send him to make me see. Dark, let him say, let there be light. May he give me faith to behold my name engraven in thy hand, my soul and body redeemed by thy blood, my sinfulness covered by the life of pure obedience. Replenish me with his revealing grace, that I may realise my indissoluble union with Thee, that I may know Thou hast espoused me to Thyself for ever in righteousness, love, mercy, faithfulness, that I am one with Thee as a branch with its stock, as a building with its foundation. May His comforts cheer me in my sorrows. His strength sustain me in my trials. His blessings revive me in my weariness. His presence render me a fruitful tree of holiness. His might establish me in peace and joy. His incitements make me ceaseless in prayer. His animation kindle in me undying devotion. Send him as the searcher of my heart, 
to show me more of my corruptions and helplessness, that I may flee to thee, cling to thee, rest on thee, as the beginning and the end of my salvation. May I never vex him by my indifference and waywardness, grieve him by my cold welcome, resist him by my hard rebellion. Answer my prayers, O Lord, for thy great name's sake. Now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.